Today our scripture reading is going to be from Proverbs uh, chapter 16, 18 through 19. Proverbs chapter 16, 18, verse, uh, 18 through 19. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Please get a Bible out and turn it to Proverbs, or excuse me, not Proverbs, but over to James chapter 3. We're going to talk about that proverb that Noah just read here in just a second. Grateful to see everyone here this morning. And uh, we're just going to have our Bibles in the book of James, and we're not going to move out of it. So once you find it, if you're visiting with us, find a Bible in front of you in the pew, and go ahead and turn on over there. Removed from the lesson this morning, I just wanted to say a couple things to our congregation here this morning. Um, number one, if you didn't get a chance to pick up the bulletin, I'm going to embarrass Noah a little bit. He wrote the bulletin article, and it's really good. He writes about a new song that we've actually been working on, uh, How Deep the Father's Love. And so be sure to go ahead and pick that up and, and go ahead and give that a read and give Noah some encouragement. But also removed from the lesson today, I just wanted to say to this church, thank you. This church has really proven what it means to be not just hearers of the word, but doers. Over the last month or so, I've been so overwhelmed and encouraged at the different ways I've seen this congregation come and strengthen the feeble knees, and I'm really encouraged by that. And I just wanted to say thank you all. This is exactly why Rebecca and I were excited to come and work alongside a congregation like this. And so keep that up. Continue to serve and love your brethren. Uh, continue to apply James 2, 14, and continue to work on that. I really appreciate you all. This morning, we're going to be talking about pride. We're in this series. This is actually my third attempt at preaching this sermon, by the way. I know it feels like forever since we've been talking about the book of James, but back when we moved here at the beginning of January and starting in February, on the second Sundays, I started this series on the book of James. And uh, I went to preach this lesson a couple months ago now, and then I got sick and wasn't able to be here. And then a month after that, I went to preach this lesson again on a Sunday night, and then I changed direction. I decided to preach on something else. So now this is the third time, so I, I promise this is what we're going to talk about this morning. But you know what? Pride is an epidemic among all mankind, and it is certainly a problem among God's people as well. Pride, even in the traces amount, even in the smallest amount of pride that's in our life, Satan will find a way to exploit that and make it a much larger and bigger problem. And that is why that proverb we just read, I want us to focus specifically on verse 18, says that pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. We're going to borrow some of this language of the proverb writer before we get into our section in the book of James this morning. I want you to imagine for just a second, if you knew you were going to trip and fall into a pit, what would you do? I'd imagine we would all look up. We'd all pay attention to what's in front of us. And maybe take that a little bit further. If we were walking and we happened to examine somebody as they were also walking and there was some distance between us, and as we see them walking, we see them look down and examine a pit in front of them. What would we think about the person who just walks right off into that pit? That's a fool. That is somebody who is blind. They're not paying attention to what is in front of them. But you see, pride, this is what I want to talk about this morning, pride blinds us from being able to see the potential problems in front of us. And in our section in James this morning that we're going to take a look at, there are three ways that pride blinds us. But there is also a solution that is offered in the end. And if we can learn how to avoid these issues, the different ways that pride blinds the Christian, we're going to have far less stumbles in our walk. Why don't we go ahead and begin reading this morning in chapter 3 of the book of James and read with me verses 13 through 18. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Who among you is wise and understanding? By his good conduct, he should show that his works are done in the gentleness that comes from wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without pretense. 
And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. Did you notice in verse 13 how James begins this section? He asks kind of a rhetorical question among the congregation that he's writing to. Who among you is wise and understanding? And I sure would hope if I were to ask that question in all sincerity this morning and I wanted to show a hand, I sure hope that there would be those of us in this congregation who would raise their hand and say, me, me, I'm wise, I'm understanding. That, that is a trait that the congregation needs are those who are wise and understanding. But when James asks this question, there's a follow-up, isn't it? If you're somebody who professes to be wise and to have understanding, do you need to be somebody who just says it? You need to be someone who proves it. Because when it comes to humility, when it comes to being wise and understanding, it is not just something we say, but it's something that we prove. But there's a really big hurdle of what gets in the way of this kind of heavenly wisdom that is being talked about in verse 18. And that, of course, is pride. Pride blinds us from that. And if I can show you a different translation of verse 13, we have those in the audience who use the NIV. I really like this because I know you might be thinking, Chase, the word humility is not in this section. It actually is. In verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. We could in some ways stop the sermon right here and close it down. This, this could be it right here. For a whole lesson on pride, we could sum it up right here in verse 13. If you really want to solve this issue, this is the short version. If you want to be wise, humble yourself before God, be meek and gentle, and allow God's wisdom to correct you. That is the solution that James is already offering at the outset to someone who is a prideful and arrogant person. But he's going to get more into that in chapter 4, but he really begins the discussion here. But if you suppose yourself to be someone who is humble, we need to be people who are proving it, not just saying it. Because isn't it pride that way? Pride isn't something necessarily people are walking around and saying, I'm a prideful person, or I'm an arrogant person. How do you normally tell if someone's arrogant? By watching them. Just by their general spirit, by the way they talk. It's not something they go around professing with their mouth. It's just how they act. And do we see how humility is the same way? It's not necessarily something we're spouting off and saying, I'm humble, I'm humble. But it's something that people have to be able to examine and see about us. And so James, as he goes a little bit further into this, he tells us really what are some of the manifestations of pride. Did you see those in verses 14 down through verse 16? Look at verse 14 specifically. If you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and deny the truth. I want to break those four things down for us. What does pride look like on a practical level? Well, the first one is bitter envy. The word bitter here is just literally, on the idea in Greek is, is something that is sharp or something that is pungent, something you, you turn your nose up to or something that kind of smells bad is that idea of something being pungent. So, so you got that idea of bitterness, but you've also got envy or jealousy. It's really fascinating to me. Brother Josh, he just did a lesson for us last Sunday night on the word zeal, right? Well, did you know in Greek that the word for zeal is actually the same word for jealous? It's the same word in the Bible. And that's why a little bit later, we're going to get to this in a little bit, in chapter 4 and verse 5, he says, or do you think it's without reason that the scripture says, the spirit he made to dwell in us envies or is jealous intensely? Do we understand the point? When we have this kind of jealousy in our heart, it really gets down to the nitty gritty of what pride ultimately is. In your outline there at the bottom of that point, someone put it this way once. Pride seeks to un-God God. I'm going to say that again. Pride seeks to un-God God. We want to take God out of the driver's seat, not just in our life, but in others too. We want to be the center of everyone's universe. We want them to see us as God. And we might not come out and say it that way, but in our actions and the way we treat other people, that's really what we're doing. We want you to see us as the center of attention. And we're going to act anyway, and we're going to say anything so that we can accomplish that. And what that really is, brethren, that's exactly what pride is. It's not just bitter envy, though. It's selfish ambition. Did you see that in your Bibles? where we're so focused on ourselves that we're pushing forward our agenda. And we do this in every area of our life. Someone who's the arrogant one, they don't just do this in one area, they do it in many. 
They do it at work. They do it with those who are under them, trying to force them to do what they want and manipulate and make them do what they need to do. We see people do this in their families where they are making the decisions and they're trying to strong arm everyone into it so that I can bulldoze my way through and get what I want done. And if we see it in our jobs and in our homes, we also can see it in the church. Somebody who wants to see things done their way and they're willing to stop at nothing to make sure things are done exactly the way that they want. And they'll hurt anybody and they'll say anything they have to in order to get that done. This is the kind of arrogance that says... What you want isn't just as important as what I want. And I will be willing to do anything to accomplish what I want. That's what selfish ambition is. He talks about boasting here. It, we understand that as a manifestation of pride. And we all know that guy. I'm sure we've all been that guy at times. The guy who's always talking about himself. The guy who's always turning every conversation into about him or herself. And is boasting about the things that they've done to try and alter your perception of how they see you. But ultimately, the text says that these people, they deny the truth. Someone who is arrogant denies the truth. And what is the truth in this case we're talking about? Well, the truth is, is you and I are not number one. You see that? You, you and I are not everything, despite what our mama has told us. And we have a lot of people who think that they are everything. They should be the center of attention. Their world, everyone's world should revolve around them. And when everyone doesn't see themselves as God wishes us to see ourselves, which is significantly lower than what He is, then how are we going to treat other people? We're bound to treat them any way possible to make sure that we're the number one in their life and that they see me this certain way. Because I'm seeking to un-God God. So these are the manifestations of pride. And perhaps a good quiz for ourselves this morning is how am I doing with these things? Maybe out to the side on a scale from 1 to 10, you can write down, well, you know what? I'm kind of a 9 when it comes to selfish ambition. I, I really struggle with really forcing my way on other people. But as the text plays out, it's in verse 15 that he really talks about the root of prideful behavior. Let's read that again. Verse 15, such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. I want us to take these four things back there in verse 14 for a second. And let me ask you this question. How does the world feel about those four things? About being someone who's bitter. If someone does you wrong, how does the world say you should respond? Well, it's okay to be bitter. They shouldn't have treated you that way. Does the world think you should be a selfish, ambitioned person? Do they think you should boast about yourself and talk yourself up? Absolutely. The reason why that is, is because that's earthly wisdom. That's what he's talking about here. That's the root of this kind of behavior. If pride were a tree, the root would be earthly wisdom. Look out for yourself only. And having anyone in your life who gets in the way of what you want, they are a toxic person and you just need to get rid of them. We need to be careful. Remember how the world works through wisdom. What the world thinks about pride. Does the world think pride is a bad thing? Well, let me remind you what the month of June is called. It's called Pride Month. Now to a Christian, if we had a Pride Month, what would that be for us? Trying to address some problems in our life and address some issues. But Pride Month is actually something that's celebrated in our culture, isn't it? Celebrating your right to be with whoever or be whatever you want to be. It's all about me. That's what pride is. And it's celebrated in earthly wisdom. James is saying it's not that way in Christianity. We have a completely different kind of wisdom. And this wisdom he tells us in verse 16 is where envy and selfish ambition is. There's disorder in every evil practice. This pride's tree, or excuse me, this tree of pride the fruit doesn't taste good. You ever bit into bad fruit before? Yeah. I've, I've, you know, sometimes I've grabbed an apple before. The apple feels good, but have you ever had like one of those sandy apples? Yeah. That's what this kind of pride or this kind of earthly wisdom tastes like. And there's disorder and every other evil. And we see that in the community that we were just describing, by the way. And we see that in churches that are motivated by pride. And so James offers a better solution, doesn't he? James offers wisdom from above. 
Not this kind of earthly, prideful, arrogant wisdom, but wisdom from above. And you see the things. This is a whole sermon in and of itself. But this wisdom from above that's pure and peace-loving and gentle and compliant and full of mercy and good fruits. It's unwavering. It's without pretense. It's the fruit of righteousness, and it's sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. If humility had a tree, this is the kind of fruit it would be bearing. So here's the point. When we are too focused on ourselves and proving to everyone else how great we are and how wise we are, it blinds us from having the true wisdom that we need. Well, James carries this idea into chapter 4. It was for the longest time I did not see these two sections as connected, but now I firmly believe this section is very connected. Look down at chapter 4 and look at verses 1 through 3 for now. What is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? You desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. We'll look at 11 and 12 here in just a second. But let me tell you what stands out to me about pride in this section is that it blinds our judgment. And the first way it does that is it creates unnecessary conflict with other people. Did you notice how James is addressing this in verse 1? Again, he asks some rhetorical questions. Hey, I want the congregation to sit there and think about, why are you guys fighting so much? What, what's the source of all of your quarreling and all of your fighting? Well, he answers it in verse 1. They come from your passions that wage war within you. They come from your pride. Your passions. When we are so focused on ourselves and what we want that we treat people any way we want to, even in the Lord's church. And look at the extremes that James uses to make this point. Did you see this? This shocks me every time I look at it. Verse 2, you desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. Whoa. They murder, it says. Could be physical. Ahab and Jezebel, they killed Naboth because they wanted his vineyard, so perhaps maybe this is a physical murdering that's going on in this church. I don't know. But are there other ways that we murder? Sometimes we use the phrasing, looks can kill, don't we? Well, if looks could kill, and I'll tell you, my mom, she had one of them looks, and I'm sure everyone's in here mama did, right? But let me tell you another way we use that phrasing. Words can kill. We might not be physically murdering one another, but we are trying to cut each other down sometimes with what we're saying. And we hear that foolish thing that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me, and we all know that's a lie. Because that thing that someone said to me in their attempt to murder me with their words, it really hurt. And it's causing this conflict between us because neither of us thought more carefully about how to address the problem or how to talk to each other about a particular issue. And so, he says, you fight and wage war. We start arguments with each other. Have you ever met someone like that, by the way? Seems like it doesn't matter on what kind of terms you're on with them. They're always starting some kind of drama, starting some kind of argument. Well, why is that? Because they're trying to make it about themselves. That's pride. That's what it is. I want to be at the center of attention. And even when the humble, or excuse me, even when the arrogant, arrogant man does come to God in verse 3, how does he come to God? Does he come to God humbly? No, it tells us that when you ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Even when the prideful man comes to God to obtain what he wants, he's asking with selfish motives. His attitude is not your will be done. And James is trying to correct this kind of behavior. Can we skip the section below this and jump down to verse 11 and 12? It connects really well. Look at verse 11. Don't criticize one another, brothers and sisters. Anyone who defames or judges a fellow believer defames and judges the law. And if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Pride also turns us from making righteous judgment to what I'll just call really hurtful criticism. I want to make a little bit of a 
correction here, just to, so we're all on the same page. The kind of judgment being talked about here is not the righteous judgment that we see in Matthew 7. Do you remember the story Jesus tells in Matthew 7 about the guy who has the log in his eye and he's trying to point out the speck in his brother's eye? And Jesus says, first you've got to remove the log from your eye in order first to remove the speck from your brother's eye. The whole point of that is, how can I effectively help get the speck out of my brother's eye? By removing the log out of my own. And so there's righteous judgment that takes place. There is correction that needs to go on in a congregation where we humbly approach a brother and we say, I don't know if you've noticed, but this is something you need to be doing better about. And whenever we go to do that, Jesus is saying you're making a judgment there. But the way you first have to do it is removing the log out of your eye. So there's a balance here. We understand that. This kind of judgment, though, let me submit to you, is not the kind of judgment that James has in mind. But he's talking about the kind of judgment that is harsh and critical, driven by pride. People who never live up to my expectations. And we have to ask, is that me? Am I the kind of person that's overly critical? That anytime change or something new happens, do I have to jump in there and just let everyone know what I think about that? And I have to be critical about it. This can become a personality trait. We all know the person. Complains all the time. Criticizes anything, anytime something else happens. Let me ask you this. When we're overly critical this way, what are we making ourselves out to be? Look back at your Bibles in verse 12. We make ourselves out to be God. We make ourselves out to be the judge. I get to be the one that goes around and nitpicks and tells everyone exactly how they live. And does that not bring back home what we said earlier, that pride seeks to what? Un-God God. I get to be the one who tells you exactly how to live. Here's the point. When we are too focused on the flaws of others and how they get in the way of our desires, it is going to blind our ability to effectively help our brother and sister in the way that we should. Let me tell you something mature Christians should be able to learn how to do. I struggle with this. Let me tell you this. Proverbs 19 and verse 11 says that a man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression or to overlook something done wrong to him. That's a hard thing to figure out. Is this something that this brother or sister has done that I can just overlook? Or is this something I actually need to bring to their attention? And it is amazing if we will remove pride from that question, how many times we will learn to overlook an offense and move on. But pride is that little voice in the back of our head that says, you can't let this go, man. You need to go to them. You need to go tell everybody what they did. And we got to learn how to let go of that little voice and overlook the transgression. Let's keep moving. Let's uh, back up a little bit into chapter 4 and look at verse 4 and 5. I want to talk about pride blinding how we see sin. In verse 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. Or do you think it's without reason that the Scripture says, the Spirit He made to dwell in us envies intensely? Number one, sin is adultery. Isn't that how he says it in verse 4? You adulterous people. And he's not talking about those who have cheated on their spouses specifically, but he's talking about those who have went out on the Lord God Almighty. Those who have stepped out of that covenant relationship that you made with God. And pride, it gets in the way of us seeing it that way. We only, want to, we only see how much we want to sin. How much we deserve to sin. And we begin to rationalize it. And so James grabs us by the shoulders and he says, friendship with the world is hostility toward God. We can't live that way. Do we not see that in our marriages, by the way, while we're talking about this analogy of adultery? What if I went up to Rebecca, just gave her a big hug and gave her a big kiss, said, honey, I love you so much. And I love you more than these two other women I've been talking to. And after I get the ice on my face, what might occur to me? <laughs> she doesn't want those two other women in my life. 
Because I vowed to her she was the one and only. But this is what we do with God. We sometimes want just a little bit of sin. And what James is trying to wake us up to realize is that makes us an enemy of God. Because in verse 5, God is jealous. Josh talked about this in his lesson last Sunday night. God is a jealous God. The scriptures say that the spirit he made to dwell in us envies intensely. Let, let me tell you what I think James means by that. You remember that God gave us his spirit? When we were baptized, it told us in Acts 2.38 that we would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in Romans 8, Paul makes it overwhelmingly clear that because God's spirit dwells within us, that's going to change our behavior. It's going to change how we act. And Paul not only says that in Romans 8, but in 1 Corinthians 6, when he's talking to a group of men in this church who are going to prostitutes, he will say, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? God's spirit dwells in me. So who am I to go out on the relationship that God has set up with me? Pride blinds us from seeing sin this way. And instead, we see it as something innocent, something that is not that big of a deal. We need to be careful. Thirdly, and lastly, the solution we need to look to is humility. Pride might blind us in all these ways, but I don't want to leave us here this morning without looking at the solution that James gives. Look at verse 6. But he, that's God, gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep, and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. If God can give greater grace, let me tell you, God can give great humility as well. That's who God's grace is there for. Those who are willing to humble themselves. Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? This is the whole mission of what Jesus is trying to teach, that we have to humble ourselves before God. James did not come up with that statement in verse 10 all by himself. Jesus said that. If you will humble yourself, you will be exalted. God promises that. So we have to have this recognition that I don't call the shots anymore. God does. I let him direct my life now. That's the kind of great humility we need if we want God's great grace. But then how many times does the text say it as well, that we need to submit to God? This is a really helpful way to understand what submission is. Yielding to God. Humbling yourself. We understand the idea of a yield sign, right? Driving on the road. If you just cram right into whoever was in that other lane, it's your fault. You were supposed to yield to them. God's asking us to yield. Submit to Him. Humble yourself before Him. And we can either humble ourselves, or we will be humbled. Charles Spurgeon, a theologian from years past, I like the way he said this. Every Christian has a choice between being humble or being humbled. And I think that is a beautiful statement. God will humble us if we don't humble ourselves. But what I love about this text is that when we ask the question, how do I humble myself? I'm overwhelmed at the many answers that James gives in it, don't, aren't you? Did you notice what he said? Start with resisting the devil in verse 7. Therefore, submit to God and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Start saying no. We've been saying yes for too long to the devil. He says we have to start by saying no. Enough is enough. I'm tired of yielding to you, Satan. I've got to start saying no. But in the process of resisting the devil, there's someone we need to run to. We need to draw near to God. He says in verse 8. And if we will draw near to God... He will draw near to us. Turn to God for wisdom. You've been saying yes to the devil. James is saying, say no to him and start saying yes to God. 
And if you will draw closer to him, things will get so much better. Thirdly, cleanse your hands, you sinners, he says. Another word for that, I think, would be repent. Whatever sin's been on your hands, we've we got to repent of that. Cleanse ourselves of those friends. Cleanse ourselves of that filth that's been defiling us. Actively walk in repentance and cut off the sin. Cleanse our hands from it. Number four, purify your heart, he says. Isn't that beautiful? Have a change of heart. Purer in heart, O oh God, help me to be Keep me from secret sin. That hymn is beautiful, isn't it? And until we internalize these truths, we will have no lasting change. It all starts in the heart. So we might say these things. We might be that person who says, I'm wise in understanding. But are we truly internalizing it the way that James is saying to purify our hearts? But here's the last one, and I find it fascinating that James ends with this one. He actually tells us how to view our past sin, doesn't he? Yes, our sin was nailed to the cross, and Jesus took that on, and we've been forgiven. But I also want you to see what he says again in verse 9. To be miserable and mourn and weep, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. What I think he's really talking about here is learning how to be miserable and mourn that sin that the arrogant spirit has had to turn away from. No longer reminiscing on past sins. How often do we find ourselves doing that? But rather, mourn them. Be truly sorry for them so that it will produce godly sorrow and true and lasting change. That is the kind of humility that James is saying we need to have if we're a prideful and arrogant person. What a beautiful solution. But let me ask you this. What is any kind of humility that we might have in our response to God what is it backed off of ultimately? It's backed off of the humility of God's Son who willingly gave up His desires to come to this earth humbly as a man to live as we did yet without sin and then humbly go to the cross so that we too in turn would humble ourselves before God and so that we too could be exalted the way that Jesus was. But that has to begin with our humility. Are you a prideful person this morning in some way? Do you need the prayers of this congregation to help you with that? That's what we're here for, is to love one another and pray for each other. Or maybe you're somebody who hasn't been baptized yet. You know that you need to repent of your sins and give your life over to Christ. We can help you with that as well. If you're subject to the invitation, won't you come now as we stand and as we sing?